Well, hello, I'm here with Caitlin. It is Tuesday, April 16, 2024, and we've got news about clean energy. But first, it's Tesla's. Go ahead, Caitlin. Thank you. So I've been missing in action for the past few months, and I think I owe our two viewers an explanation. Both of you deserve an explanation. So I've been, uh, so around Christmas, I got a little bit of burnout, nothing serious. Uh, but I, you know, changed around my life and tried to figure out ways to make sure that just would not happen again. Um, it turns out, and I kind of want to get the, and the reason I'm explaining explaining this is because I wish someone told me this. So it turns out, at least in my case, all the tips about avoiding burnout, burnout like weren't practical. Um, I tried, you know, relaxing, spending more time doing things that I enjoy. What I actually ended up having to do was the exact opposite. I had to turn off all the stuff I enjoy. I sort of went into this like low um, stimulus environment and created a low stimulus environment. Um, it turns out that burnout is mostly emotional and not so much, oh, you have too much work and you're not, you know, relaxing enough. Um, so that was, that was sort of my big epiphany oh. uh, through all this. And so um, I ended up creating this low... Uh, stimulus environment in my apartment and my work uh, became super productive again. And now I was doing like double work because not only was I super productive, I was sort of wanting to make up for the time when I wasn't productive. And then we had CCDC um, and HackspaceCon, so sort of back to back. Uh, so I spoke at HackspaceCon uh, last weekend. Uh, there was also Western Regional CCDC, where we did fantastic. The red team always wins. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of, of the work we did. So, yeah, no, that's where I've been. I've been uh, just yeah. super, super busy. But I'm back. All the big stuff I've gotten out of the way. So, Well, I didn't even know there was a thing called Hackspace Con. But if there is, you totally belong there. Oh, no, it, it, there totally is. I spoke there. I gave a talk on aerospace engineering for hackers. Yeah. Um, you know, because if you are if you are a on a red team, if you want to do any serious security work in computers, you got to know how to program, and and you should know how to program well. And if you are doing anything involving like security in space, likewise, you should know aerospace engineering, or at least the basics, right? Like you 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 don't have to be an expert, you don't have to get a degree, but you should know how these things are designed, why they're designed the way that they are what the developers are thinking when they put these together why are why are they choosing parts that they do you know that kind of stuff so well, good. Um, i gave a talk on that and right. yeah no hackspace con is totally my jam i i barely go to conferences but when i do it's always hackspace con <laughs> well yeah i would think so yep well good i'm glad you're back I'm glad you're doing better yeah, yeah no I, I wasn't doing bad in in the least in fact just the opposite i was busy hacking students Hacking the planet, kicking kicking butt at work. I mean, I was just really on it once I, because, and like I said, it really is burnout's out to emotional, not like you're just too much work. Um, and so the other thing is like, just don't care about work. Um, like, like, like work hard, work hard, obviously, like put, put all your effort into it, but don't stress out about it. That, that gets in your way, way more than anything else. Yeah, I think it does. When when your self worth depends yeah. on it or something, it's. But I think everybody has to find their own way to overcome this. This is yeah. the problem in the modern age. You know, I grew up in the country where you can work on a farm and things are sort of placid and repetitive. And now we are in <laughs> have so many great things to do. There's too many great things to do. <laughs> Absolutely, to there's choose. too. It, it's hard to choose, and you know, like like the other day, um, someone in our chat was like, "Hey, you want to put up high altitude balloons?" And yeah. I'm like, yeah, that'd be great, but it would require like me driving without a car, <laughs> yeah. like uh, you know, to San Francisco every week, you know, for you know to work on this and everything. I was like, ah, oh, no, I, I have other things I need to get done. So there's just too many awesome things you could be doing. You do need to learn to say no. Yes. Yeah. Well, good. And like I said, don't don't stress out about work. If there's deadlines and stuff, just do the best you can. If you don't meet them, you don't meet them. If you do meet them, great. I mean, you know, just don't, it, the stress will hold you back more than, than anything else, right? In, in research science, I think that's true. In legal yeah. work, deadlines mean a lot more. 
you do need to meet meet your deadlines. I'm not saying you don't meet your deadlines. Don't try to meet your deadlines. But if you are, for example, a software developer and you're just oh. fixing bugs, fixing bugs, fixing bugs, fix as many as you can and don't stress out like, oh my God, I'm I'm behind. Just just do your best. I saw an interview <laughs> with Bill Gates when he was in charge of Microsoft, like around the time of Windows 98. And he said, why is everything six months late from you? And he said, well, you know, you try to set a deadline, but then it takes more time and, and you just have to let the deadline slip. And she said, did this make sense to you? <laughs> Couldn't understand yeah. how anybody could take this attitude, but that was his attitude. And you can tell because of the excellence of Windows. Oh, um, <laughs> I mean, Windows Windows was was always very um, they they had a they had an uphill battle. Um, so a lot of people compare Windows to Mac OS, but the two are not similar at all. Mac OS, of course, the main portions of Mac OS is has already been done for Apple and is maintained for Apple. Right. Uh, it's, of course, based off FreeBSD. Microsoft's like, no, we're going to do everything and support more hardware and add all these new features and support and make our thing mainly targeted towards like large businesses and not individuals. I mean, it's... And support legacy stuff all the way back yes. to MS-DOS and do it with complete contempt for logic. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, Microsoft just decided we're just going to make the ultimate thing and it's gonna, they're the only operating system out right now that's not Unix right. in any way. I mean, there's there, there's there's a few niche well, operating yeah. systems you can find. Like there's Temple OS. <laughs> Temple? <laughs> Temple OS, yeah. Some There was some crazy guy who went nuts and thought he was building like the third Temple of God or something like that and called it an operating system. Uh, <laughs> it's technically not Unix. So. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, there are a bunch of them out there that aren't Unix, but they're all pretty much died. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, I mean, there's tech, there's OS2. I don't think that really counts because that's too tight to Microsoft. I think there's a lot of them here. BOS. So, so Haiku. And Minix. Yeah, yeah. So Haiku is very Unix y. I don't know if I would call it not Unix. Okay. Um, But certainly there's like the Amiga OS. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I never did understand what that thing was. I used it for years, but. Yeah. Sort of like you reinvented MS DOS kind of. Yeah. So anyway, uh yeah, Microsoft just does its own thing, writes all its own software. I mean, it's it's really a thing. But anyways, like I said, but for your own mental health, don't don't stress out about work. Just don't. Just not your problem to stress out about. You will be more productive if you don't, and then you'll get raises and more money, and that's what matters in the end. So there's times for different pressures. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, just don't, like I said, it, at least for me, it's, I I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to be the best I can be. And if I wasn't the best I can be, I was, you know, just stressing out and everything. And and the second I, I threw that aside, yeah. I was much happier and much more productive. So anyway, I think that's just me. It might not work to, for you. Yeah, I think it's yeah. quite difficult to adjust this stuff and you have to try different options so you find one that works for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, my, my story might not apply to you, so... Yeah. Uh, just one anecdote. Anyway, so let's talk about Tesla. Tesla, Tesla, Tesla. Um, aha, here we go. Uh, so, yeah. So as per usual, full self-driving Teslas are a disaster. They apparently keep bumping into curbs. So that's this is from Insider EVs. Do we have a name here? We do. It's Rob Stumpf. So Rob here says that... Um, the the Tesla's full driving software is is apparently getting people like hit into curbs as it like tries to turn corners, um, which I mean is not the worst thing in the world. It's not like running over people, but it's still um, something that that needs to be worked on. So it seems like the first thing people did when we started to crack machine learning is full self driving. But full self driving is a we have completely solved all machine learning issues. We are masters of machine learning. And now we can apply it to these death machines, uh, yeah. <laughs> driving people around. So, you know, and, and we're still just not at the stage where we need to be for, for full self-driving. But once we get there, it'll be great. This is in the OWASP top 10. It's called excessive agency, where you let an AI have control of something that it really isn't good enough to control, like a car. Ex- Exactly, exactly. I mean, it, it AIs still don't understand the context. 
Uh, so it does not understand that it is driving human beings around that are worth more than it. That you know that it doesn't understand that it's on Earth. It's just it's it's fitting lines to a curve. It's still basically yeah. linear regression with a lot more dimensions. Yeah, and it's basically <laughs> just playing a video game. Yes, <laughs> it's it's yes, it's playing a video game for us, uh, which is fine. I mean, and uh, to a certain extent, but it's not. It, it, having something like this is end stage machine learning, not. You know, oh, we we just now have LLMs that can make videos. I mean, we this is like, oh yeah, we've done this for like a decade. We understand how it works. We have all these toolings and stuff to like fine tune and understand what's going to happen in all these situations. W once we get to that point, we can start industrializing it in cars. But we're just not not there yet. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I found a couple short ones here. Truth Social has often been accused of being a a. a illegal clone of Mastodon. And someone went and, uh, and requested the source code saying, well, this is, he first he looked through Truth Social until he found a page that had the elephant right there. He actually had a page, a graphic right from Truth from Mastodon. He said, all right, you guys have based this on Mastodon. Therefore, it's open source code. Therefore, you have to give me the source code. And they did within a week. They gave him the full source code and he's posted it. And he's shown that it is in fact just three different open source projects tied together Mastodon for the back end, something else for the front end, some other product. And but since they are in fact distributing the source code, I think they're not in violation of the license. So, but anyway, it's open source software and it even seems to be uh to some extent playing the game right by handing out source code. So that's interesting. And I suppose somebody could hunt through that source code and find bugs. But anyway, um it's of course a financial disaster, but but it is an open source project. Now. It is open source, and and it's it's great that these yeah. large, large companies and and Donald Trump is embracing the communism of open source software. This is this is fantastic. He is so so we so all the open source advocates should vote for Trump as the champion of of truth and justice. Uh, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah, no. He's the champion of open source software. So if you're like Richard Stallman, yeah, Trump's your guy. There you go. That I would make total sense for Richard Stallman to be a uh, mega guy. Uh, <laughs> and and there's another one which is kind of amazing to me. CISA has a malware analysis tool, and apparently was only used like for a few hundred times in the last year. It was restricted to government and military, so they've just opened it to the whole world. So you can upload your malware to CISA to have them analyze it for you, like Virus Total. And so I haven't tried it yet, but that sounds pretty awesome. Although I do not understand how CISA can take on all this extra work. I think they might get flooded with too many requests, but I guess we'll find out. Anyway, uh, those are the ones I wanted to mention. And let's hear the big one about uh, the energy. Yeah, no, so this is really good news. Um, so TCD, uh, the uh, the cooldown.com, um, has this article by uh, Jeremiah Budin and talking about California's energy grid going completely 100% renewable for most of the month, um, most of last month. So uh, it was 20, 25 out of the last 32 days, uh, the California energy grid was 100% renewable, which really begs the question, why have energy prices gone up so high <laughs> um, in the past month from PG&E, um, which, which actually has more to do with the fact that they have to now upgrade their entire infrastructure because they kept killing people. Right, that's um, that's delivery of the energy. Once they make it, is the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so the delivery is why the why the prices are going up, but uh, the the infrastructure itself is has been upgraded to the point where we're now at um, largely one hundred percent renewable, and it's just a, a few more upgrades. It looks like yeah. until we are just one hundred percent just uh, solar and wind, and we'll, you know, and hydroelectric. And we're done. So that that's good. Um, I, I never thought I'd ever ever see this day. Um, and we're not even using nuclear power for this at all. Um, so, so our coal fire plants are just sitting there. I, I think we do have natural gas and probably coal in any grid, but I guess they only turn them on when they need them. I guess. Um, yeah, like I, I guess like they might have turned them on when I got my new server. Um, yeah. My my energy bill went up another hundred dollars a month uh, when I turned that on. <laughs> but uh, other than that, I'm I'm yeah it's it's yeah 
Oh, so to be fair, California was green until you got that server and now you ruined it. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We got we got a the red team, the WRCCDC red team needs to practice. So oh uh, yeah. All right. Well, there's a, a uh Brian Krebs has an article, and I think she ISA even got involved at this thing called um smart locks. Um Chirp smart chirp system smart locks have been out there, and apparently they have a hard coded password that can open anybody's door, and it's just sitting there in the Android app. And someone told them in 2021, and they don't care. They didn't do anything. The company got sold to someone else. They're ignoring everybody. They're even ignoring CISA. So that's pretty awful. And when I read that, I said, "Gee, I wonder how hard it could be." So I wrote it up for my students as homework. It is way too easy. All you do is dump the app in JAGX GUI and search for password. And it's just right there. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty ridiculous. And uh, it is, and it reminded me of, um, there's a new security law in the UK that just passed, which says you can't do this anymore. You know, the CISA had a recommendation for IoT devices a few months ago with like five or six things you could do that would really be good. And the UK has a new law that says you cannot ship stuff with a default password. Not anymore, not in the UK. So if we had a law like that here, it would have prevented this chirp disaster along with so many others. Uh, anyway, um, let's go on to you and your uh, ransomware. Yeah, so in today's day and age, having international cooperation is a rare commodity. And 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 one thing that, that we really need to value. So... I really want to give credit where credit is due to all the wonderful hackers who are being in, in the U.S. who are being recruited by um, uh, by Russian gangs to, to hack uh, hack cybersecurity. You know, do various computer crimes and stuff. So we're having a lot of a lot of international cooperation here. So what's going on? So there's this article here on CBS News um, about essentially there are these. Russian gangs, and they're going off and they're recruiting young people who probably don't truly understand what the scope of what they're doing. Um, it's really easy, especially when you're young on the internet, to not sort of fully realize that there are other people on the other end of what you're doing. And that, yeah, you're making money, but that money's coming from, you know, real people's pain and suffering and and you're causing real damage. And you don't really realize that if you're, if you're really young. So a lot of Russian or a few, I should say, uh, Russian gangs are recruiting young people. And when I say young people, I mean people under the age of 25. And that can mean like 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, you know, people, you know, kids who aren't even in high school yet, uh, being recruited into these cyber gangs who are ransoming corporations for millions of dollars. Um, so that is, that's a problem. <laughs> um, and I, I don't really know a good solution to this other than, good parenting like you, you just have to teach your kids not to not to be criminals i mean i don't know what to say watch no, what your kids him. do online don't don't let them get into into gangs well you know i think the fbi helped us a lot around 2011 and 2012 there were all these hacker gangs and the fbi just arrested them all until they, they kind of went out of fashion you know back then yeah. young people were joining these gangs like crazy but they didn't have any ransomware there was no money in it it was just for glory right now that there's actually money in it, I'd say there must be a, an endless supply of intelligent um, people that are desperate for money worldwide that you can hire. Yeah, and if you're, you're young, you're you're almost desperate, and like I said, you don't truly understand the consequences. Like an AI. Almost like an AI, exactly. I mean, you're just. I mean, it's it's just the nature of a nominee, the the nominee, the nominee. Anonymity of of online yes of yeah. online crime yeah yeah well I got a few other little ones that are kind of fun Telegram has a code execution vulnerability because you can download a file on Telegram and it checks the extension to decide whether it's executable and it won't run it unless it's not executable but they spelled one of the Python extensions wrong. It's supposed to be PYZX, but they would PYXZ, something like that. So you can make a Python zipped file that will execute when downloaded. And uh, oh, what what program is this again? Telegram, the probably one oh. of the world's most popular instant messenger. I quit using oh. it because it's a Russian product. 
but people use it like crazy in order to watch the insider crime gangs and stuff or anything oh. about the Ukraine war. Oh, okay. Anyway, um, and uh, Putty, which most of us have used for years on Windows, Putty has a key recovery attack vulnerability, which is pretty hilarious. They used elliptic curve cryptography, apparently, and they need to 521 random bits to be the nonce to be the cryptographically random 521-bit modulus. But the libraries only go up to 512 bits. So they just said, oh, that's close enough, and used it. So the first nine bits of the nonce are zero. Now, how much difference does that make? It turns out to be incredibly fatal. There are special attacks just for that, and you can recover the um, complete private key with like 60 signed messages or something. So it's pretty oh, it's drastic. I don't know who's still using Putty. I mean, now we have SSH built into PowerShell, but um, yeah. I guess a lot of people are probably still using it because you can save profiles and stuff. But uh, anyway, I, I wonder how long it's been broken too, because Putty is really old. Yeah, I imagine it's been broken for a while, especially especially like you said, the the library didn't support the full <laughs> bit width. So I imagine that's to make two calls, and why would you bother with that? <laughs> we'll just... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And this one I thought you would like. Um, the quantum IBM made this quantum computer, and they claim their quantum computer has quantum superiority by having this really goofy, hard to understand calculation where they say it's faster than a classical computer. And people pressed back and said, wait a minute, you can do that on a classical computer. So they did it on a Commodore 64 with 8 bit <laughs> processor running at 1 megahertz, and they outperformed IBM's quantum system. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah, so that's. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, you could argue that L that's, there's this article uh, Kaz posted a while ago saying that uh, LLMs are pretty much a boondoggle. And uh, you could argue that quantum systems are all these things are new systems and whether they're actually going to turn out to produce more value than they cost to run remains to be seen. Well, you know, I, I still think that AI is, well, LLMs are, are kind of useful, but yeah. The the real usefulness of AI is solving algorithms that we don't know how to solve yet. That that there is value in that. Period. Period. Yeah. And, and, and stop. You, you need to denoise an image. We don't have a good algorithm for that, but we can use machine learning. Boom, we're done. Awesome. You need to fold po proteins. That's really difficult. Yeah. We can do it faster, easier with machine learning. That's that's the value of machine learning, not not LLMs in particular, but just like. You know, and and for special effects, we're now getting into text to movies. That's going to decrease yeah. the cost of special effects. There's value in oh, yeah. in LLMs. Yeah. Um, I think now that... what? Yeah. Now now what's really funny is if you ask me if there's any value in AI, like a few years ago, I would have been like, no, that's been studied forever. I you know, know. No, nothing's coming out of this. You know, we should just ignore it at this point. I know. Um, it seemed like it was one of those things that was never going to happen because we needed yeah. to be like a million times faster. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I'm still, so now I'm sort of opening my mind a little bit to be like, okay, maybe, maybe we should still continue to do research into quantum computers. Um, although I will say that they are much less complex uh, than I initially thought before I got really deep into like uh, physics for work and stuff. Um, like you can literally make your own like single qubit, <laughs> like quantum computer. Uh, essentially using lasers and like special filters. Uh, um, it, it's not very useful, mind you, but you know, they're, they're not as like super amazingly complex. It's only when you have like a whole bunch of qubits that they become useful. And that's where we're just like, yeah, we don't know how to do this. So. And they have to be high quality, which is the yes. problem. Their current yes, ones exactly. are way too noisy. But I well, I think quantum computing research is great. And I think AI research is great, but, yeah. but both of them, are very are very fairly compared to the early internet. You know, when the early internet came out, it was useless too. People said, what is this thing for? You know, I think it takes a, a while of development before it shakes out and turn out what it's really good for. Exactly. In the early days, it's just like a waste of money and time. Mm -hmm. But uh, but, but yeah, def definitely AI is, has sort of revigorated my spirit that it's, it's not always a bad idea to to continue research on things that that maybe haven't panned out so far. And and another good example of this is the blue LED, which everyone sort of gave up on. Yeah. Um, there's one inventor in um, in Japan whose bosses were like, we're taking away your funding, we're taking away everything. And he was just sort of like autistic and like, no, I'm just going to keep working on this. He got his, 
his superiors got so mad at him. And then he finally cracked it. And his company made like millions and millions of dollars. They obviously got the first patent on the blue LED. Everyone wanted one, changed lighting forever. And his company, I think, paid him like $40,000 a year and like <laughs> still hated him because yeah. he just wouldn't follow order. I mean, it's stuff like that. You just you just have to keep pushing at it, pushing at it, even when people tell you it's it's not a good idea. Um, if there's okay. promise, I mean, yeah. That's a, I remember there was a story like that a few months ago of a woman who invented something awesome like CRISPR and her college like fired her and they cut her grant and everything saying, what is this garbage? And she just kept going. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, yeah, you, you just have to have that attitude. Um, but the, the, the thing is to know when things have potential and when things don't like quantum computing has potential. Yeah. Cold fusion. I haven't, no, I mean, no. That keeps coming back. I mean, that's he's coming problem. back, but th there's never been any sort of successful, even primary like like in the case of leds we know we can make red leds we know we can make yellow leds yeah you know um we know we can make green leds it's just blue you know it's just one more step you know quantum computing yeah we can make one with with one qubit we can make them with many qubits but they're noisy you yeah. know we, we, can, we can just keep refining keep refining but there's some things like you know just no no when there's like just no supporting evidence just leave it all well, you know, my parents spent 20 years trying to make a battery out of living cells, and it was just a disaster. It went nowhere. I remember after 15 years, Dad said, I finally figured out that all our results come from me not washing the beakers well enough, so we get random variation. Yes. So, you know, not every wild idea is worth pursuing, but anyway. Well, you know, once again, there was no, like, proto-cell battery that sort of worked, right? Yeah. Once once you get a prototype that sort of works, you can keep working on it. But just make sure you have that one prototype that sort of works first, and then you can start investing more time in research. and And it may take decades, may take may take a long time. That's all. Well, this is the whole Silicon Valley VC, uh, you know, culture. If you can get some kind of prototype, then you impress a venture capitalist and you're off to the races. But you do have yeah. to impress them and convince them that your idea is going somewhere and it's not just a stupid idea. Yeah, which most really good ideas sound really stupid at first. So, yep, it's a real art to present it right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so I, I, I'm totally not the right person to do any of this. I'm not very creative. I do stuff that's like in textbook stuff. So, none of yeah. my stuff is new. But all right, well, that's it for this one, and I'll have another one on Friday. No, we're it's not. We're not done yet. We're not done. We've got oh, something got super. Oh. No, no, no. We've got something very important. Well, Check this we... out. What? Oh, it's your the black eye, yeah, it's the black eye uh, galaxy. The what is it? Black black eye galaxy. Black eye, okay. Black eye galaxy. So what you're seeing oh, yeah. is a lot of dust clouds, yeah, uh, sort of covering up a lot of the the central galaxy. It's called the dark eye galaxy. It's a Messier uh, object, very popular among amateur astronomers. Right now, it's galaxy season, uh, so. Lots of lots of pictures of galaxies hopefully coming up. I'm, I might be off to Seattle for a few weeks. Um, and as you know, I've been super busy, so I haven't been taking too many pictures. But the Black Eye Galaxy is a pretty cool, yeah. cool little specimen. No, it does look like a, an eye. It's very nice. Yeah, it looks like an eye. And apparently there was like a collision between another galaxy that caused all the dust and stuff to stir up, which creates this lovely contrast between the bright center of the galaxy and all this dust obscuring um, a lot of it. So yeah, it's got that thick shade at the bottom, like Doonesbury. Yeah, exactly. Very nice. All right. Well, now I think we're done. We oh oh. Why don't you explain your background, Sam? Oh well, my background. I just I've got some random eclipse picture. You know, it's nothing special. It was was that from the twenty twenty four Great uh, American Eclipse? I don't oh, know. Okay. I just found one that looked kind of pretty. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, so there'll be another one of these on Friday. Another eclipse? Very good. Another podcast. <laughs> uh, okay. I can't tell you're doing nothing but trouble. <laughs>